Good evening. On behalf of the Goldman School of Public Policy and the Cal Alumni Association, welcome to Alumni House and California Live. I'm Chloe Hewlett, Executive Director of the Cal Alumni Association, and I'm overjoyed to see all of you tonight. I'm even more delighted to see so many Cal alums and friends here to join us for this conversation. We have the president of CAA board, Jason Morimoto, and the full board of CAA in the house tonight. This is a tremendous sight. I want you to know just how important you are sitting in these seats, supporting an event like this, which encourages open dialogue on cutting edge issues, and at the same time supports CAA and the Goldman School of Public Policy. This event is part of the California Live Lecture Series, which brings exciting ideas from UC Berkeley and is featured in the California Magazine, if you haven't received one, is right outside to you. And thank you very much for joining us. Before we get started, I'd like to express our deep appreciation to the Goldman School of Public Policy for co-hosting tonight's event. Since I'm also a public policy specialist, in addition to being, for the Cal alums, your executive director, the Goldman School has a very special place in my heart. But even more important, the Goldman School is raising the next generation of leaders who will shape our world for generations to come. We are grateful for the support in particular of Dean Henry Brady sitting on our panel. And Annette Dornbos and all the panelists representing the Goldman School proudly. We would also like to thank Hafner Wines for their generous sponsorship tonight and their support throughout the years for our Cal family. Tonight's theme is surreal politics. How anxiety about race, gender, and inequality is shaping the 2016 presidential campaign. And I know you share my excitement about having this esteemed group here to help us navigate through the rather remarkable and interesting political season. Now, a number of you have completed question cards and we'll be happy to pick up the completed ones and pass more around as needed. Our panelists will answer a number of these questions at the end of the presentation. And I'm sure you've noticed cameras present tonight because we'll be recording this event for online broadcasts on the UC Berkeley events and UC public policy channels. Now our moderator for tonight's world-class panel is my dear friend, Maria Akchaveste. Maria is the Policy and Program Development Director at the Chief Justice Earl Warren Institute on Law and Social Policy. She joined the UC Berkeley School of Law as a lecturer after serving as a senior White House and US Department of Labor official and as assistant to the president and deputy chief of staff to President Bill Clinton. But I had the pleasure of watching Maria in the last presidential election on television debating her husband while he was supporting one candidate and she was supporting another. <laughs> She left no stone unturned then, and she will leave no stone unturned now. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our moderator, Maria Echeveste. That 
that's what that's what makes tonight so fun. I thought the 2008 election was like one for the history books. Little did I know, 2016 was going to surpass that. So we have a wonderful panel of experts to help us think through and talk about some of the issues facing us this extraordinary year. So first, as you heard, Dean Henry Brady uh, is our dean from the Goldman School of Public Policy. Um, he's written on electoral politics and political participation. Um, he worked for the Federal Office of Management and Budget. By the way, I happen to respect people who work at OMB, as my husband did, because they control the money. Um, he has written uh, uh, numerous books uh, and articles on political participation, political methodology, Dynamics of Public Opinion, and he is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, where he was elected in 2003, as well as a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2006. So welcome, Dean Brady. Um, <laughs> Professor Jack Glazer is also at the Goldman School of Public Policy. Uh, he received his PhD in psychology from Yale. He conducts research on stereotyping, prejudice, discrimination, the enormous uh, range of uh, phenomena relating to unconscious thoughts, feelings, motives, racial profiling at the moment, very topical. And his expertise extends to electoral politics and political ideology and specifically the role of emotion as experienced and expressed in politics. And may I just say, for some of us who have been in the trenches, who argue policy, policy issues, who never understand that it's about emotion and values, thank you, Dr. Glazer. So also is Jonathan Stein, who has both an MPP and a JD from Berkeley. He's a civil rights attorney, currently at the American, Asian Americans Advancing Justice Asian Law Caucus. Uh, it is the nation's oldest Asian American civil rights organization, and previously he was the, with the ACLU of California. Very interestingly, though, he was also part of what I fondly called when I was in the White House, the hated media. He was at Mother Jones. Uh, so <laughs> I say that with affection. Um, <laughs> he was at Mother Jones as a researcher, assistant editor, blogger, and campaign correspondent during the 2008 presidential elections. Thank you. So you can. Pardon? Oh, I'm, this is, oh, Sarah, forgive me. I moved too quickly. Um, professor, as a fellow woman, I am so sorry. Uh, <laughs> professor and author Sarah uh, Anzia, who earned her PhD in poly political science from Stanford. No hisses in the audience? <laughs> as a Stanford grad, it's okay, you can his, but also be supportive, is a political science scientist who studies American politics with a focus on state and local government, elections, interest groups, political parties, and public policy. She also studies the role of government employees and public sector unions in elections and policy making. She has written about the role of public pensions, women in politics, the historical development of electoral institutions, and the power of political party leaders in state legislatures. Sarah, forgive me, Professor Ansia. So our, the format is going to be brief comments, presentations from each of our panelists no more than eight minutes, because what we really want is a conversation among these panelists who come to this moment uh, six weeks out from the election with differing views and thoughts about how this is shaping up. So, um, Hen Dr. Dean Brady is gonna start, thank you. Uh, 
I just must say that as Dean of the Goldman School, it's really wonderful to have two of my faculty members and one of our star graduates here. Um, it really is wonderful. It, it makes me feel so proud because it really is an extraordinary school that produces extraordinary people who go into the public sector uh, with an amazing faculty that is, can do two things that not every academic can do. Uh, one, great research, most academics can do that, but second of all, really be involved in the policy process. Uh, so if, just to take one example, Jack Glazer advises police departments on how to improve policing. So Jack knows the real world out there and deals with it. Um, so I wanna, I'm gonna set this up by talking a little bit more or less about the primaries and about Sanders and Trump and the outsiders in American politics and what role they've played in setting up this election. And what I want to really talk about is American populism of the left, which is Bernie Sanders, and American populism of the right, which is Donald Trump. And point out that interestingly enough, populism of the left and populism of the right meet on a common concern with economic issues. They differ remarkably with respect to issues having to do with uh, race in America, uh, the place of immigrants in America, and women in America. So they differ on what we call the social issues, but they actually come together on the economic issues. So I'm just gonna show you some data. I can't do a talk without data. We once had a dinner party. My wife asked me, why are all these people here tonight? I said, they all love data. <laughs> she looked at me like, huh? But it was a great dinner party, right? She's... <laughs> Anyway, so here's what I do in this talk, and I'm gonna show you a bunch of pictures in which I line up the candidates according to this uh, lineup. On the left will be Bernie Sanders, then Hillary Clinton, the other major Democratic candidate, then in, we're gonna skip independents, but they're sort of in between, and then Republicans, I'm gonna have people who supported Bush, Christie, or Kasich, uh, those are the governors, basically, who were in the primaries. Those are insiders. Uh, Senator Rubio, uh, then uh, Carson, and then uh, Ted Cruz, and then finally Donald Trump. So sort of a left to right spectrum. And by the way, we're going to use color coding like they use on election night, <laughs> which is blue for the Democrats and red for the Republicans. Uh, when they did this, by the way, the reason they gave blue to the Democrats was because if they gave red to the Democrats, it would have been too true to type. <laughs> I don't know if people even know about that joke anymore since it's so many years since communism has been a major issue in America, but this crowd should get it. <laughs> um, so, this just shows you in the sample. This is a study that was done in January by the American National Election Studies. They are the gold standard for doing election studies in America. They did a representative sample of Americans and asked them a bunch of questions. One of the, asked, the questions they asked is, who do you support? And so this is the percentage that supported each one of these candidates or groups of candidates. And what you see is on the left, a majority supported Hillary Clinton, and on the right, a majority supported Donald Trump, and of course that's how the primaries came out. But there were people who supported the other candidates as well, a lot of people who supported Bernie Sanders, that's the leftmost blue bar, uh, although not so many who supported the other Republican candidates, those are the lower little diminutive bars uh, representing the, the various other Republican candidates other than Trump. So now let's just look, given that lineup, so along the horizontal axis is that lineup. And what this is, is it tells you something about the religious orientation. And there's two questions. Are you born again? Do you go to church frequently? And what you see is the Sanders supporters, remember Sanders was an avowed atheist, not surprisingly, they're not very religious. But notice the Trump supporters aren't very religious, especially considering that they're Republicans. So we get this parabolic kind of line. So you see that already it looks like maybe the Trump supporters are in some ways a little like the Sanders supporters. Educational level, and I'm sorry I put two lines here, but basically look at the blue line, and the blue line is college or more, and that's another parabola, and so Sanders supporters, relatively low education, Trump supporters, low education, and the other candidates have people with higher education supporting them. So already we see that Trump and Sanders supporters are 
supporters are people with very little interest in religion and low education. And then finally, voting turnout. You, this includes a question about did you vote in the last election? Do you intend to vote in the 2016 election? And you find out once again, the Trump and Sanders people are similar in that they're not very focused on politics. They didn't vote very much in the 2012 election. They're not even sure they're gonna vote in the 2016 election. So the Trump and Sanders people are not that much attached and, and fixed and focused upon politics. So those are their characteristics. Uh, so this is just a summary of that, what I've already said. The one other thing I don't have in there is it turns out that the Trump and Sanders supporters are similar in that they actually are, are much more white than some of the supporters of the other candidates. Uh, so for example, Hillary Clinton has a much more rainbow coalition in terms of Hispanics and blacks. And actually, uh, uh, Rubio had a fair number of Hispanics who were supporting him. Uh, so now let's look at economic issues. So this is a set of questions. Is it harder to succeed now than in the past? This taps people's concerns about has America changed? Is it a place where it used to be possible for somebody like me to get a job in a factory and make 30 or 40 dollars an hour, but now I can only get a job if I'm lucky in Walmart at maybe minimum wage? And what you get is this parabola now inverted this way like a bowl shape where Sanders supporters are very worried about the lack of opportunity in America and so are the Trump voters. Again, coming together in terms of economic anxiety and concern. How about free trade? Free trade is one of the sources, many people think, of the problems that folks who were in manufacturing now have because those manufacturing jobs have gone overseas. And once again, you see that Trump supporters are most concerned about free trade. Uh, they're most in opposition, it, in opposition to it, whereas the Sanders supporters are also in opposition, but not quite as much as the Trump voters. But still, more in opposition than the Clinton supporters or the other Republican supporters uh, for the other candidates. So on economic issues, the Trump and the Sanders voters look very similar. So where do they differ? Well, how about attitudes towards social groups? And I've just chosen a few here. Gays and lesbians, feminists, Muslims. We do this on what's called a feeling thermometer, which goes from zero to 100 degrees. So 100 degrees means you're very warm towards them and like them. Zero means you're very cold. Notice that towards these groups, supporters of Sanders and Clinton are very positive high thermometer scores. But notice how the lines basically just drop towards Trump, a little bit of wiggle at the end, but mostly the Trump supporters are the most negative about these groups, uh, especially Muslims and gays and lesbians, a little less so towards feminists, which is sort of interesting, but I, I'm not sure I would put a lot of stock in that slight wiggle upwards at the end. The major thing here is that you find out that the big difference between the Trump and Sanders supporters, we all know this, is that the Sanders supporters support what you might call the outsider groups in America, whereas the uh, Trump supporters are against those groups. And then just to give you another sense, fears of terror attack. Sanders supporters not very much worried, that's low on the left, and then it goes up to the Trump supporters quite worried about a terrorist attack. Again, fear of the other, fear of the outsider, xenophobia. And then finally, identity is an American, how important is that? Sanders supporters say, it's not that important to me. Trump supporters, it's all important. So this is an overlay of patriotism, Americanism, um, a sense of the importance of being an American and not being an outsider like those other people. So what we get is, Symmetry on economic issues, the populist left and right come together on economic issues. But they diverge fundamentally with respect to social issues and race and with respect to outsider groups. So uh, there's an article out there by a guy named Philip Klinker who makes this argument. The headline, in fact, of his uh, article is this. The easiest way to guess if someone supports Trump, ask if Obama is a Muslim. He claims that the entirety 
of Trump's support is really based upon racism, xenophobia, things like that. And I want to tell you that I just don't think that's so. I used actually the exact same data he used. I think he analyzes it incorrectly. And furthermore, I think his analysis is a bit dangerous. It's dangerous for liberals because if we're going to dismiss, dismiss Trump supporters as simply racists, we're going to miss the fact that they're also economically very challenged and upset and worried about the future. And if on the other hand, if we're Republicans and we dismiss Trump and say, oh, he just had this sort of odd appeal and we don't quite understand what it's about. And furthermore, what we really need to have is a real Republican and then everything will be fine. You're gonna miss the fact that the group of Republicans who have been attracted to Trump are people who have historically been bought off by the Republican Party, by the Republican Party talking about these race and social issues and appealing to them. But the party's done virtually nothing for them on economic issues, and in fact, arguably hurt them. And so Trump now is saying, you've been hurt economically, and I have a solution to your problems. And the solution is to get rid of free trade and some other really, frankly, not very coherent notions, but nevertheless, a program that at least appeals to their economic concerns. So I think it's important to understand that Trump supporters are not just about racism and xenophobia, they're also about the fact that there's a group of people in America that support Trump that are deeply anxious and worried about the economic future of this country, and they too need some attention along with the people who were Bernie Sanders supporters who were concerned about inequality in America, because in fact they converge on those concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Yes. Go ahead, Professor Glazer. I'm sure, like me, uh, you're all dying to ask questions. So there, if you blank pieces, the note cards, if you have questions, make sure you write them. We'll be collecting them. We'll have an opportunity for real give and take. Professor Glazer. So uh, let me tell you why I think Donald Trump will be the greatest president in the history of the United States. <laughs> okay, no, I'm just kidding. Um, let's just get it out on the table. Uh, I, don't, I don't feel that way. I was being sarcastic. Um, so in fact, what we have, what we're, what we're staring in the face is that on the heels of the first non-white American president, uh, we may be on the verge of electing the first non-male American president. And I'm referring to Hillary Clinton in that case. And, um, and that's very significant because for much of American history, uh, there has been an aversion to the notion of electing a black or a woman to the presidency. And in fact, here are some data, and I apologize that the numbers are kind of small. Uh, these are data, data from the Gallup polls over the years, ranging from 1937 to 2007. The orange bars represent the proportion, the percent of uh, white male Americans in the earlier phase and then all uh, Americans sampled in the later phases who indicated that they would be comfortable uh, voting for a woman for president if she were nominated by their party and were competent. And so you see in 1937, only 34% of respondents were comfortable with that notion. And it climbs steadily to the point where in 1997, 98, it's at 90%. And it actually ticks down slightly in 2007 to 86%, um, which may actually, I hate to say it, be a Hillary Clinton effect because she was the woman on the ballot that year. Um, uh, as far as African Americans go, they didn't even start asking the question until 1958 at which point 37% said that they, were, they could vote for an African-American nominated by their own party if he were competent. And that gets all the way up to uh, 94% in 2007, which is, of course, the year that the Democratic Party nominated uh, Barack Obama and he won the election. Now, you'll note that that's still only 94%, so 6% of respondents are willing to say to a, to a survey taker that they are not comfortable voting for an African-American or uh, in the case of women, 14% not comfortable voting for a woman uh, if that person were nominated by their party and were competent. So we still have a ways to go. And as a person who studies subtle forms of bias and implicit and non-conscious bias, 
I, I see this as the relative tip of the iceberg and that there's a larger proportion of people who are uncomfortable but not willing to say it, and then yet another set of people who are uncomfortable and don't even know that they're uncomfortable and they will have reservations in the voting booth. These numbers get broken down uh, in later years more, more precisely so that we see whether people would be comfortable with a lot of different groups like socialists, atheists, Muslims, evangelicals, gay or lesbian, Mormon, Jewish, Hispanic, black, a woman, and a Catholic. And uh, you can see that uh, these numbers vary, that people are uh, v fairly, still in 2015, fairly uncomfortable voting for a socialist or an atheist. Uh, and if you may recall, this guy, uh, he fell into both of those categories, as well as this category, the Jewish category, which does better, that's his strong suit, um, which says a, a lot about where our country has got, gotten to. Uh, Hillary, of course, falls into the woman category, and uh, where she's getting up around 94% this year. And Donald Trump is not, the, his category is not asked about in this survey. Uh, it's, I think, just sort of the default uh, counterexample that we, that we assume. But I would wanna say that I don't think it's a fair assumption that 100% of Americans responding to a survey like this would say they would be comfortable voting for a white male uh, for president. So I don't think 100 is the right contrast point, but it's probably pretty high. Uh, as far as gender goes and the gender of the, po of the voting population and the candidate, uh, what we see is that um, over the last uh, 10 or so elections, well, when women turn out, uh, the Democratic margin of victory is, uh, is great. Well, sorry, I should say when, when the women's margin of victory for the Democrat is better, uh, the Democrat tends to win. And we see this, and I'm putting a question mark in 2000, but in fact, Gore did win the popular vote in that year, so that comports with that. The only exception, uh, but it's a small one, is 2004. Okay, one take home point that I want to, to give, if nothing else, uh, without going into the specifics of this particular research, but there is a whole tradition of research in political psychology that has found, as Maria alluded to earlier, that much of voters' decision-making is based on emotion or other kinds of shortcuts. Like, for example, the biggest predictor of who you're gonna vote for is the party that you identify with. And a big predictor of the party you identify with is the party that your parents identified with. So you can see that as much as we in the policy professional sphere would like to think that people are making these determinations based on careful policy analysis and comparison and contrast, much of it is, as we would say in psychology, heuristic, shortcut thinking. And psychologists like Bob Abelson and colleagues have shown that, in fact, affective, emotional responses to candidates account for a large share of people's voting decisions. And the campaigns have known this for a long time by invoking uh, slogans like, in your heart, you know he's right. And then it turns out that the emotions of the candidates are important as well. Uh, Ronald Reagan was an excellent example of this as somebody who uh, could win debates with the volume turned off, uh, even by larger margins than with the volume turned on. And, um, and, and some of these studies by Sullivan and Masters and their colleagues have shown just that sort of thing. Uh, this is just a recent headline that I think sort of speaks to this notion at rallies, Hillary Clinton supporters are looking for logic, not passion. Um, we'll see if that applies to the people who don't go to her rallies and, uh, and are potentially thinking about voting for her but haven't committed already. There's a fascinating concept within social psychology uh, developed by a local guy named Paul Ekman uh, called display rules, which dictates that the way that we display our emotions differ uh, for different groups and for different situations. And I think politics is a very special, important condition for that, where there are more constrained rules about what kind of emotions you can display. Having said that, this year it seems like all bets are off and I'm not gonna make any predictions on that front. Uh, but with regard to historical examples of politicians violating display rules, you may uh, recall that Edmund Muskie uh, was leading the Democratic primaries in 1972 and after an incident where he appeared to cry during a, or, or shed a tear during a rally, uh, he quickly collapsed in the polls. As to whether there's a causal relationship there or not, we don't know, but that's been the long attribution of that. Uh, you remember, may remember Howard Dean's yeehaw moment, which although he had just done fairly poorly in the Iowa primaries, that did seem to be the, the precipice of the end of his, of his uh, campaign. 
And then there's the other example of uh, candidates who have been caught not displaying enough emotion. And uh, Michael Dukakis was criticized for not being emotional enough in response to a, uh, an alarming, disturbing hypothetical that was posed to him during a debate, in contrast uh, to the very emotional George Herbert Walker Bush. <laughs> and the research also shows that, that yes, that was sarcastic. Uh, the research also shows um, that in the same American National Election Studies data from 2008, that in fact, uh, the, the stereotypes with regard to the emotionality of the candidates and the emotions that they appeal to seem to be right. And in fact, in 2008, Barack Obama inspired more hope and pride, and John McCain inspired more anger and fear. Uh, and in fact, it turns out that, uh, that in, a, in a large statistical analysis like the kind that Henry was describing, where you try to predict who people are gonna vote for, statistically controlling for all the obvious candidates like voter, uh, party identification, ideology, uh, the race of the voter, and other demographics, that, pref that, that hopeful response to Obama really did predict uh, voting above and beyond a lot of these other things. I'll just throw in there quickly that a measure of implicit racial bias, preference for whites over blacks, also predicted a tendency to vote for McCain and to vote against Obama. And just one last thing I want to point out to create some context for this current election is a very recent poll uh, from the Wall Street Journal and, uh, and NBC, MS, uh, or NBC. And this is just from the last couple days, and they're showing Clinton ahead nationally uh, by about six points. But, and let me say that uh, any single poll should be taken with a huge grain of salt. Uh, this is also recent polling data from around the same time. NBC, Wall Street Journal, and Ipsos Reuters, two fairly reputable polling firms, same time period, both using likely voter models. One is predicting Clinton by seven, the other is showing a tie. Over the, so, you know, we have to take these with a grain of salt. I'm sure that will come up more later on. But getting back to this poll, uh, this was a surprise to me that among the people who are showing an intent to vote for Clinton, uh, a greater proportion of them are, are saying that they're going to vote for Clinton as opposed to voting, voting against Trump, and that flips for Trump. And that was not what I uh, would have expected to see in this. I think that's actually very good news um, for Hillary Clinton because there's a perception that people are not excited about her, but it's starting to look like maybe they are. And speaking of excitement, I will close by thanking you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Glaser. Yes, yes. And now we'll hear from Dr. Anzia. All right, I'm gonna start by quoting President Obama. Uh, this is from a speech he gave last week. He said, this should not be a close election, but it will be. And the reason is not because of Hillary's flaws. There's a reason why we haven't had a woman president. We as a society still grapple with what it means to see powerful women, and it still troubles us in a lot of ways unfairly. So let's talk about gender in this election. For the first time ever, we have a woman at the top of a ticket for a major political party. Um, it probably seems like we should be able to take the vast body of research on women in politics in the US and use it to somehow say something about how being a woman is going to affect Hillary Clinton in November. How is it gonna affect her vote share? How is it gonna affect her chances of winning? Actually, it's hard to say anything even close to definitive for a lot of reasons. I mean, here, this, she's, the first reason is that Hillary Clinton is one woman, the first to ever be um, a major party presidential nominee, and she's pretty unusual. She's been first lady, she's been secretary of state, she ran for president um, in 2008. She has all these issues dogging her, like the emails and the Clinton Foundation. On top of that, people haven't voted yet. So yeah, sure, we have certain people telling pollsters how they think they're gonna vote, but that's not the same thing as knowing how people actually voted. So all this makes it really hard to figure out what's the impact of the woman factor gonna be for Hillary, Cl for Hillary Clinton. But even though we're in an unprecedented situation, um, there is a lot of research on female candidates more generally. Maybe we can try to turn that, you know, turn to that to make a guess about what the woman effect will be for Hillary Clinton. So that's what, what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk, give you a little bit of an overview of that research, and then I'm going to. I don't know, give you some reasons to question some of its conclusions and how they might apply um, in Hillary Clinton's case. So let's start with one of the things Obama said. There's a reason why we haven't had a woman president. 
So it turns out that this is a, a version of the major question that has motivated a lot of research on women in politics generally. That is, why do we have so few women in elective office in the United States? For many of you, maybe the answer seems kind of obvious. Um, that is, well, elected officials are chosen by voters, so maybe voters are biased against female candidates. They're less likely to vote for them. In other words, uh, there's a, is there a penalty for being a female candidate? Well, here's the thing. Research on women in politics has actually largely ruled this out as an explanation. There are a lot of um, big studies that came to the conclusion that there is no electoral pen penalty for being a woman. How do they do this? Well, actually, it's, this is based on a large number of studies that compare the vote shares of male and female candidates running in similar races. And they find that the female candidates' vote shares aren't significantly different from the male candidates' vote shares. On top of that, men and women tend to raise just about the same amount of money in their campaigns. So this has led to a conventional wisdom, almost a slogan. When women run, women win. Okay, because, and, and so the problem, in other words, is that not enough women are running. It, because when they actually run, women do just as well as men. So voters aren't discriminating against female candidates. To add to that, as Jack mentioned, there are these well-known stereotypes, in this case, stereotypes of female political candidates, that they're more liberal, that they're gonna be more compassionate and collaborative, um, that they're gonna be stronger on issues like education and weaker than men on issues like crime and foreign policy. Um, now, it's one thing to say that these stereotypes exist. The question is, do these hurt women's chances when they run for office? So research by Deborah Jordan Brooks is very great, is very, is excellent research she finds that these stereotypes actually do not hurt women's chances in elections. She does these survey experiments and finds that stereotyping by gender doesn't lead voters to give lower favorability ratings to women um, running for office and doesn't lead them to rate women lower on likely effectiveness. So again, the conclusion again is that on average, voters don't treat female candidates differently than male candidates. Okay, as a result of these findings, all the, the really exciting research going on now is, is not looking at how do voters evaluate female candidates? Instead, it's looking at things like um, gender socialization and how that affects political ambition. Why is the pool of female candidates so small? Um, you know, why are fewer women um, thinking of themselves as able to run for office? This is really important work. I don't mean to minimize its importance. But getting back to this year's election, take these conclusions I've just described, apply them to this presidential election. Well, what does that mean? that Hillary Clinton's being a woman will have no effect on this election? That's not what Obama's saying. Uh, maybe some of you are wondering, can that be right? Okay, again, this gets back to the problem of looking at one woman and one election, especially when the opposing candidate is someone like Donald Trump. So there's been a lot of commentary, as you know, in this election cycle about sexism um, and sex bias. Some of that's positive. There are a lot of people who want to vote for Hillary Clinton because she's a woman. They want to see a woman in the White House. But a lot of it's negative as well. Um, just to take some examples, there have been claims uh, that Matt Lauer was much harder on Clinton than Trump in last week's presidential forum. Um, there have been complaints that people don't like it when Hillary Clinton raises her voice. It's shrill. Meanwhile, you have male candidates yelling and waving their hands around and no one seems to be bothered by it. Um, there are comments about how Hillary Clinton doesn't smile enough. Um, there, people say that there's disproportionately uh, more media coverage of her appearance, her hair, her clothes. By the way, I loved this piece. Hillary Clinton's husband wore a fetching pantsuit to honor her nomination for US president. And of course, it's not just about Hillary Clinton. Um, we have a Republican nominee who had a rift with Fox News anchor Megyn Kelly. He insulted Carly, Carly Fiorina's face during a debate. There are lots of comments coming out of Trump rallies, many of which, um, you know, a lot of which people would say is sexist language and comments. So there are a lot of claims of sexism floating around. And maybe you're asking yourself right now, well, really? Is this going to have no impact on the election? So I'm just gonna offer you a few reasons why you might question this, why you might question this claim that sex bias by voters is a thing of the past. First, let's go to the Gallup question that Jack mentioned earlier, where they ask, would you be willing to vote for a presidential candidate with these characteristics? And then they get to say, yes, I'm completely comfortable voting for this sort of person, um, or I'd only vote for such a person with reservations, or no, I, I wouldn't vote for such a person. And let's focus on um, the uh, second column from the left, which is if, you're a if the candidate was a woman. 
You can look at this and say, well, yeah, it's good. Actually, most people are willing to say they would be totally comfortable voting for a woman. You can also look at this and say, 22% of people openly say that they would not vote for a woman or would only do so with reservations. That's a pretty big number. These are just the people who will openly say that. Um, so it's, and it's bigger than the share of people who say they wouldn't vote for a black candidate. No one's saying that racism is a f by voters is a, is a phenomenon of the past, keep in mind. Second, there's this research by um, Jennifer Lawless and Richard Fox. They survey people in what they call a candidate eligibility pool. These are lawyers, uh, people working in business, in activism, education, people who might become candidates. And they find that 77% of men and 91% of the women in this pool say they perceive there to be sex bias in the, the electorate. So are all these people just wrong? Or is there actually something to this? Um, and then also, let's go back to those studies that find that men and women get equal vote totals and they conclude that this is evidence of the absence of sex bias. Well, there have actually been some studies either suggesting or showing that um, the average female candidate is of higher quality or more qualified than the average male candidate. In other words, it takes more for women to actually enter a race. Well, now all of a sudden, their equal vote totals don't quite look the same, do they? Because if you have a higher, quali a more qualified pool of female candidates getting the same number of votes as a, a lower, a less qualified pool of male candidates, that's evidence of the presence of sex bias, not its absence, okay? So think Hillary Clinton. What does it take to have a woman at the top of the ticket? You have to be Hillary Clinton. Uh, President Obama said it at the convention. There has never been a man or woman, not me, not Bill, nobody more qualified than Hillary Clinton to serve as President of the United States of America. All right, just a few more things to think about. Maybe gender stereotypes affect female candidates more negatively when they're running for president or governor rather than legislator. That's a possibility. Second, maybe there are some voters who are biased against female candidates in other ways. It, maybe it's not stereotypes, but they're saying, I just don't like the idea of a woman president or implicit attitudes. On top of that, um, another possibility, let's go back to this question of why we generally have few women um, in public office. Maybe it's less about the average voter in the United States and more about subgroups. For example, more Republicans are willing to say they wouldn't vote for a woman for president than Democrats. And in a country where you have roughly half the seats for House of Representatives in sa being safe Republican districts, maybe these are places that are off limits for a lot of female candidates. So I'll conclude. Um, if you take the conclusions of this body of research on women in politics and you try to apply it to this election, I think all you can really say is that, well, the fact that Hillary Clinton's a woman is going to have very little to no impact on the outcome. I, I think that's a conclusion at least worth questioning, uh, given everything we've seen in this election cycle from both parties. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Antia. Oh. We have a lot of great questions, so we will have a chance to have some back and forth in our last presentation. OK. Um, so I have no data. Uh, <laughs> I, I have pictures. Um, I'm a voting rights attorney, um, and I want to share uh, some of um, my thoughts uh, with you in sort of a different way. So this photo is from uh, March 7, 1965, um, on the march from the attempted march from Selma to Montgomery after the protesters and marchers on the left had just crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge and run into the troopers on the right. This picture was taken on the left, excuse me. This picture was taken moments before the troopers attacked the marchers and the, the visuals from that moment were interrupted the newscast for the nightly news that day and brought images of police violence against the civil rights marchers into the homes of white Americans. It helped catalyze white support for the movement, and a successful march from Selma to Montgomery was completed on March 21st, two weeks later, with federal support and federal protection for the marchers, okay? The Federal Voting Rights Act was passed just a few months later in August of 1965. So people of color in this country have had access to a free and fair vote for 51 of this country's 238 years. So I want to walk that history with you. All right, this is interactive. Um, at our nation's founding, in our first presidential election, who was able to vote? Shout it out. White guys, nice answer, not quite. White, white male landowners, okay, US born white male landowners. In the first election, in the election in which George Washington was elected, 6% of the American population was able to cast a vote. In 1790, we expanded the vote for the very first time. Does anyone know who got the vote then? Hint, immigrants, 
no, non-landers was sort of a state-by-state -state issue. It was white male immigrants, okay? So we expanded the vote in a minor way then. The next jump was not African Americans after the Civil War, it was actually Mexicans living in United States territory at the conclusion of the Mexican-American War. So America won the Mexican-American War, took a, basically a third of the Western United States, and in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848 that ended the war, it granted citizenship to Mexicans who had just become Mexican-Americans. Mexicans who didn't cross the border, the border crossed them. Um, and, uh, but English language only in voting um, and violent intimidation of um, what were now Mexican-Americans kept them from exercising their vote in many of the same ways that um, violent tactics against blacks in the Jim Crow South kept African-Americans from exercising their right to vote. African-American men got the right to vote after the Civil War. Anyone know the year? 1870, with the 15th Amendment. Um, I want to draw your attention to the fact that we were founded in 1776, and it took almost 100 additional years for African-Americans to get the right to vote, and it took almost 100 years more after that for the passage of the Federal Voting Rights Act to make that vote real. Um, in uh, Women were the next up. Um, anyone know the year that the 19th Amendment passed? 1920, 1920 exactly right. And here's where the um, timeline of voting rights in American history usually jumps straight to the Federal Voting Rights Act, but we're actually missing one group. Does anyone know who that might be? So you know, there's two answers that usually come up when I ask that question. Native Americans is one. The history of Native American voting rights is incredibly convoluted and torturous. Native Americans were sometimes given the right to vote if they served in the American military, sometimes if they agreed to assimilate into white culture, and there's no simple way to put the Native American story on a slide. Um, the group I was getting at was Asian, Asian immigrants. Um, so does anyone have a guess when um, Chinese Americans were given the right to vote, Chinese immigrants were given the right to vote in America? The repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1943 granted Chinese immigrants the ability to become American citizens and to exercise the right to vote, okay? So Chinese had for pre previously been blocked from entering the United States for a number of decades. The Chinese Exclusion Act repealed that ban, allowed Chinese immigration, and gave Chinese uh, individuals who were here the opportunity to become Chinese Americans. Indian Americans and Filipino Americans, excuse me, I should say Indian immigrants and Filipino immigrants came next in 1945. And in 1952, Congress finally gave up the idea of granting the uh, opportunity for citizenship and thus the opportunity for voting rights to Asian immigrants in a piecemeal fashion and finally decided that all Asian immigrants could become full citizens of this country. So the opportunity for Asian immigrants to become full citizens of the United States of America is exactly the same age as my mother, who is in fact an Asian immigrant and a citizen of this country. So now we jump to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which outlawed election systems and devices that um, resulted in racial discrimination um, banned literacy tests and other devices used in the Jim Crow South and allowed federal monitors to register voters in the South and monitor elections there. Across the South, voter registration among African Americans was under a third. In some counties, it was one or two percent. In Mississippi, white voter registration before the passage of the act was 70 percent and black voter registration was 7 percent. Within two years of the passage of the Voting Rights Act, black voter registration across the South was up above 50 percent. And from 1965 to 1985, the number of state lawmakers who were African American in the, in the Jim Crow South went from three people to 176 people. It was one of the single most effective um, pieces of legislation Congress ever passed. But it was incomplete until 1975 when Barbara Jordan, a trailblazing congresswoman from uh, Texas, expanded the Voting Rights Act to include um, protections for language and minorities, including Latinos and Asian Americans. And this is where much of the fight continues today, particularly in a state like California. People assume we don't have voting rights challenges in this state. In fact, since 2000, the Federal Department of Justice has sued San Diego County, Riverside County, San Benito County, Ventura County, Alameda County, Napa County for failure to provide language protection to um, Latino and Asian American voters who need language assistance in voting. Um, so it has been, as Nelson Mandela would say, Mandela would say it's been a long walk to freedom. Um, and I would argue to you today that that long walk is not over, that Selma was not the end of a walk or a march for full citizenship for people of color, but instead a milestone. It wasn't a destination, and that that walk continues today. In fact, I would argue that it is the promise of the Voting Rights Act becoming real. It is the promise of racial equality beginning to become real in this country that it leads to Trump and much of the support for Trump. And in this election, we have the opportunity to go backwards, which is why I want to show you this video to really um, 
put a fine point on it. I want to credit, whoop, can I start this? I want to credit Marianne DeMarco, who made this video. Do you believe that you've done anything to create a tone where this kind of violence would be encouraged? I hope not. I truly hope not. Get that guy out of here. Get him out of here. In the good old days, this doesn't happen because they used to treat them very, very rough. And when they protested once, you know, they would not do it again so easily. In the good old days, they'd rip him out of that seat so fast. I'd like to punch him in the face, I'll tell you. All right, yeah, get him out. Try not to hurt him. If you do, I'll defend you in court. Don't worry about it. I love the old days. You know what they used to do to guys like that when they were in a place like this? They'd be carried out on a stretcher, folks. All right, get him out of here, please. Get him out. Get him out of here. Knock the crap out of him, would you? Seriously. Okay? Just knock the hell. So much fun. I love it. I love it. say to you that the echoes of the civil rights movement are alive in this election. I want to say to you uh, that, let's see here, I want to say that um, the walk is not yet finished. I want to say that Black Lives Matter. I want to say the name of Terrence Crutcher, who was killed by a police officer in Tulsa, Oklahoma this week, with his hands in the air seeking help for a broken down car on the side of the road. And I want to say that when you vote in November, vote like the freedoms the liberties, the safety, the lives of your black brothers and sisters, your Latino brothers and sisters, your immigrant brothers and sisters, your Muslim brothers and sisters are on the line, because I believe that they are. Thank you, Jonathan, uh, for that impassioned and uh, just because I've worked in government, I have to say that Jonathan's views are Jonathan's views. <laughs> and we don't have a political motive in today's discussion. I'm just saying that <laughs> for the reasons that we all know. So, um, but it actually raises, we have some great questions. And I've, I want to start with, um, given especially that last set, um, we, how many remember the Bradley effect? Bradley effect, when Bradley lost to Duke Mason, uh, where p polls showed that uh, Mayor Tom Bradley, first African -Amer American mayor in Los Angeles, was leading. Um, is there a Trump factor? Is there a Clinton factor? Is there something behind in which the polls are not telling us? So I'm going to ask kind of rapid fire, crossfire. Um, let's start. Well, we, we don't know, but I suspect that there is. I mean, first of all, there are lots of problems with polls. Um, and any one poll, I think the, the best estimates are the ones that combine the polls. Um, but even those, that you, you do not know what people do when they get to the uh, in, you know to cast their vote. And they know that no one will know. So, so you would say there is a Clinton factor? I think both. that's what I was implying. Yes. Um, yes. Um, although it's hard to say whether there is or not, whether there is or isn't. I have heard some skepticism about the Bradley effect itself. So there's been a new look at that, and it's not entirely clear that there was a Bradley effect with Bradley. But I'll defer to Henry. I don't know if you know better. But I believe that this kind of thing can happen. And I, I would say that if there is going to be an effect of that sort where people uh, can't get themselves to vote for the person who they are saying that they're going to vote for when they get into the voting booth, that I. I don't imagine that that's on the Trump side. I do imagine that that, that would be on the Clinton side, that there is there is no um, stigma, particular, that, that there, is, there is stigma associated with saying you can't vote for the woman because that's sexist, and that people may not be able to execute that when the time comes. But I'm, I'm pretty confident that if that effect is there, that it's going to be small, and part of that is that Hillary Clinton is essentially, if she wins this election, she's going to be elected by Democrats, 
largely, and some independents. Uh, and I think that this effect would be over on the Trump side of the, of the aisle anyway. So I, I, I don't think this is going to have a large effect. Dean Brady? Well, I would just say that uh, you, you do have to wonder whether there are Trump supporters out there who might not be professing that in polls on the grounds that uh, that's de classe and not the kind of thing that a person should say. Uh, and so I do worry a little bit about that. And so that would be opposite to the kinds of effects you're talking about. Um, and I, it, as, as Sarah said, we don't know until election day. I would say, however, that my strong suspicion is that the polls are generally got it right. And right now, they generally say that Hillary Clinton's going to win. Um, I, I'm skeptical of the idea that there's anyone who wants to support Trump but is embarrassed to say it out loud, or anyone who feels they need, they, they, um, need to say to a pollster that they support Hillary Clinton when they don't actually intend to do so. I think one of the characteristics of the Trump campaign is that everything that used to be subtext has become text. Everyone is liberated to express their sexism, their racism, and their xenophobia out loud in public. They've been liberated to do so by the Trump campaign, in my opinion, and I don't think anyone has any hesitations about their, their prejudice anymore. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question for Dr. Glazer, which is, uh, I'm gonna shorten it a little bit, uh, but essentially there was an excitement in 2008 for uh, candidate Barack Obama. Where is that excitement for Hillary Clinton, or why is it missing? Well, it's not entirely missing. And, and, uh, and that, that graph that I showed indicates that there is some degree of enthusiasm among Hillary intended voters. Look, let's face it, you know, you can't, as good scientists and as good students of, of electoral politics, you, you can't look at any two candidates and try to equate them in any way. And Barack Obama is an exceptional, an exceptional unusual, uh, magnificent candidate. Uh, and so he evoked a lot of enthusiasm, in part because of his personality. But I hate to say this, but um, I sometimes refer to Barack Obama as George W. Bush's finest legacy. And that uh, I don't know that an African American could have won that election had the incumbent Republican not just destroyed the brand. And so uh, you know that, that's, that's a difference as well. I will say, though, however, that Obama is and he energizes people, and Hillary Clinton has a different style. And that's the emotion part. And you know, hopefully, uh, you know, to the extent that we want the population to get the candidate that they deserve, people should be looking at who these people are and what they've done and what they can do, and not how they make them feel in the moment. Jonathan? Chris Rock had a joke in 2008 that George W. Bush was such a bad president, he made it hard for a white guy to get elected president. <laughs> Uh, other comments and I, one follow-up. Also, I think it's um, widely recognized that when women get emotional, it's perceived as emotional. And there was an article in the New York Times about this today. But it, it's perceived as emotional, not focused on the issues. Whereas men get emotional, it's about you know they're focused on the issues. So I think there's some of that going on too. Um, Jonathan, can I just jump in and say yeah. that that gets back to the display rules notion. Not only is there the politician display rule on Hillary Clinton, but there's the woman politician display rule imposed on her. She has multiple filters that she has to go through, and it's just a double bind, triple, quadruple bind. Right. That's a whole other conversation. Yes. Uh, so, um, Jonathan. There's been a lot of talk about the way the media has played in this election cycle, both how they've ma various members of the press have managed, how they focus on Hillary, the things that you were talking about, um, Dr. Ancia, about uh, the focus on what she's wearing, how she looks, and what role has the media played yeah. in this particular snapshot of time? Yeah, yeah. So I. I I'd say former member of the media. Right, right. So I think there's two, two things I'll say. The, the first is, I, I think that the media has done a terrible job at um, ad adapting to Trump because he's a new kind of candidate and a new set of rules needs to apply. So Nate Silver um, uh, uh, tweeted this, um, but I think it's quite interesting. He said, basically, if you, if you were to have a scale of how controversial someone is, uh, how controversial a candidate is, how many scandals they have, how often they lie about things, 
um, and you had it like one to 10, right? And Mitt Romney was sort of scandal free. He was a one or a two. Obama's largely scandal free. He's a one or a two. Clinton has the email scandal and the foundation stuff. And so maybe she's uh, five. And Trump is like a 50. But, but, the, but the media has a scale that goes from one to 10. And so the media is like, OK, you're a seven, and Clinton's a five, and we're going to treat you accordingly. right? And, and the media just hasn't figured out a way to fact check and, and truth tell as fast as Trump can obfuscate and lie about things. Um, and, and I think the other thing is, like, so take, for example, um, Trump recently embraced uh, um, stop and frisk. And originally, he said, I, I want to do stop and frisk nationwide. And then he said, actually, I just want to do it in Chicago. OK. There's, there's, three, there's three problems with stop and frisk. One is, stop and frisk is unconstitutional. It's been ruled unconstitutional by a federal court in New York City. Okay, So there's that problem. The second, it was, it's, it's a violation of equal protection. It's violating the rights of a minority um, New Yorkers. The second problem is, even if it wasn't unconstitutional and we couldn't actually do it, uh, it's, it's openly racially discriminatory. 83% of New Yorkers stopped and stop and frisk stops were black or Latino. It, it is just legalized racial profiling. And then number three is that the data doesn't the data doesn't show that stop and frisk actually brought down crime. Ever since we stopped uh, stop and frisk, crime in New York City has has continued to drop, even though stops are dramatically down. And Jack, I know you have more to say about this. I think we have an expert. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so here's the thing. Here's the thing. So Trump said something that makes no sense in three major ways, and is really effectively just a dog whistle. I think the, the media doesn't have the ability to break down stop and frisk in a substantive way before Trump says the next crazy thing the next day, right? And so you can't pack policy analysis and, and, and sort of um, 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 fact checking into the news at the pace that Trump moves the news cycle. Other thoughts? Number four, the president doesn't get to decide what local yeah. police do. Yeah. Yeah, very so important thing. Trump is not going to get to institute stop and frisk anywhere. Other thoughts about the way the media played you've talked about in your presentation? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that <laughs> you, all you have to do is look at the front page, and it's all about Trump um, and the crazy things he says. And you know, there has been, or it appears that there has been disproportionate focus on uh, how Hillary C Clinton looks, and you know that she's not smiling enough, and when she's talking about ISIS and um, and things of that sort. So <laughs> there, there is some of that. I don't know how anybody could smile when you're talking about ISIS, but okay. Um, let me shift a little. Uh, in the realm of national and global issues, right? I mean, as someone who worked in the White House, I honestly don't know why anyone wants this job. <laughs> Thank God there are people who want this job. How important are the issues of identity, race, gender, as we face the issues of globalization, global climate change, terrorism, how, how do our domestic politics relate to what actually a president has to deal with, which, as we know, domestic, international, but thoughts? Jack. Oh, me? Really? Mm -hmm. okay, that one? <laughs> That's He's easy. Your boss. He gets yeah. to tell you what it is. <laughs> oh, I do. I'm on sabbatical. <laughs> <laughs> Thought I play that card. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is one of the painful things to observe in an election. Um, and part of it is, obviously, the, the president has to govern domestically and internationally, and has to deal with social policy and fiscal policy and national security and all of these different things. And the campaigns tend to get hung up on little particular things. And they become popularity contests as well. If we were to select a president in a rational way, <laughs> it wouldn't really look anything like this at all. Uh, you know, and, and the history, as Jonathan points out, of having 6% of the population from the start selecting the president, it, that's the precedent that we have to operate on. So I, I, I know this is not a direct answer to your question, because your, your question is kind of mind-blowing uh, and, oh, and crushing at the same time. Good work. Whoever that was, thank you. Yes, you, thank you very you crushed, much. You crushed me. And, uh, but yeah, you know, how are we possibly going to tease apart in this debate, these three debates coming up, who is equipped for, for doing that? And Henry has the answer. Well, no, I don't. I just think, <laughs> I think the debates are going to be very important, and it's going to be very interesting to see 
if in the debates we actually do get some sober discussions of these issues, or whether Donald Trump, even in that venue, is going to be able to control things. I mean, they've been pushing on the Trump side to get rid of the moderator. Of course, that would be great for Donald Trump. He could then just do whatever he darn well pleased. So the moderator's role is going to be exceptionally important. And will that moderator say, you've talked too long, or you're saying things that are irrelevant, or let's talk about the issues, let's get back to what's really important here, or even maybe do a bit of fact checking on the fly and say, Mr. Trump, that, surely that's wrong. Uh, and we'll see if that happens. That's very hard for a moderator to do who's a newspaper person. They don't like to do that, and that gets back to some of your points. But it's going to be very interesting to see how this first debate plays out. I think it's the most interesting debate we've had since possibly the first debate, which was Kennedy-Nixon in 1960. Jonathan, you have some thoughts? I can see your eyes. I do, yeah, <laughs> I have thoughts. Um, well, I'll say, well, I don't want to talk too long. But um, the one thing I'll say, if we're talking about the debates, I think Clinton has an impossible task, which is that um, People are much more interested in the back and forth between her and Trump than she, they, they are in the concrete details of her college affordability plan or the changes she would make to um, you know, the K through 12 education. Um, and so she has to push back on some of the things he says. She has to fact check him. She has to call him out on things. And when a male candidate were to do that, they would appear strong. They'd appear like they had backbone. They were standing up to the bully, et cetera. But it's so easy, for, I think, for female candidates, and particularly for Clinton, and Sarah's been pointing this out, right, that, that when Clinton looks strong or forceful, it's equally likely that people are like, turn, they're like ugh, she's so shrill, she's, she's any number of adjectives, right? And so Clinton has to play this game, but if she goes one step too far, it actually turns out to be a negative for her, and I think it's a really, really hard balance for her to strike. So let me stay with this for a moment, because uh, of the experts on this panel, let's just admit it. Donald Trump has, from the debates uh, during the Republican primary, in part succeeded because he plays outside the rules. Whatever was accepted behavior in terms of how you answer questions, how you respond to, it's like, it's over here. And I would suggest that most of the candidates and frankly, a chunk of the media is like, they, they're they like, how do we do deal with this? Because he's not playing by the rules. So in these last six weeks, as America makes a decision, and let, I apologize for saying this, but there is a little bit of American exceptionalism going on. I hate to tell you, but electing the president of the United States affects not just our country, but the planet. It does. Yeah. So how does having someone who doesn't play by the rules, breaks all boundaries, going in the last six weeks, debates, how do, we, how do we manage this? Well, do remember Clinton still is ahead on average <laughs> in most of the polls. Nate Silver gives her about a 60% chance of winning. And actually, that seems to be going up. Um, I think the thing that's very disturbing to me about this whole election season is I was actually hoping that Donald Trump might stay with some of his concerns about inequality in America. And instead, he's pretty much given up discussing those issues and has really focused a lot on the xenophobic race, uh, those kind of sexism, those kinds of issues. And so here we are. Uh, and I think that's the great tragedy of this election is it should have been much more about inequality, which I think is a fundamental problem in this country. The Sanders campaign showed that. The early Trump campaign showed that. And we simply lost all sight of that. Anyone? I'm a, I'm a little less, um, I, I'm a little less sanguine about Trump's actual motivations around um, inequality. And I'm, I, I'm incredulous that someone with his background and his history of how he's dealt with other people actually had real concerns about inequality. And I don't know that you're implying I'm that. I'm not implying that. But, he, but you're right, he tapped into that vein. Uh, and I don't think we should be entirely surprised that he hasn't been faithful to that, to that vein. And I think what he's found in his 
echo chamber, which is big, but it's still an echo chamber in those rallies that he goes to. And I hear that he's especially attentive to, and he's especially uh, confirmatory, uh, biased in his confirmation of information that he gets, uh, that the, the loud signal that he's getting is the xenophobic one and, uh, and the exclusionary one. And he's echoing that. And, and you know, it's not, an, it's not a coincidence that the Republican nominee was the king of the birther movement. Uh, on the heels of the first black presidency, that he was the person who was going. He's ended that though now. Oh, yeah. he, he ended that. And blamed Hillary totally. for it, yeah, right? And, then, and it was Hillary that was yeah. actually the problem, yeah. yeah. But that, you know, that, that he created his political identity trying to delegitimize the first right. non white president. Uh, and, and he instantaneously got a core of supporters doing that who have stuck by him, and he's been listening to them. And for whatever reason, that message is not alienating as many Americans as we would have thought it would. Uh, but on the other hand, we know about the power of party identification. And if you look at the numbers, it's essentially Republicans saying they're going to vote for him and Democrats saying they're going to vote for her. And the rest of it is you know, in the margins. And that, those, are, those are really stable phenomena. Uh, uh, phenomena. I don't know if you agree, Henry, but I think the biggest predictor here is party identification at this point, and we'll see where it goes from there. Well, before I go to it, thought, Jonathan? Well, one, one follow-up quickly, I, and I'm stealing Tom Mann's thunder here, so I'll just say that. But um, he makes this great point about how the Republicans, Republican elites, while I feel sorry for Paul Ryan, and I feel sorry for a lot of the people who are cringing, I'm sure, it's, they did far too little to um, silence um, the the birther movement and to silence Donald Trump and you know they it, and it, it they, while they didn't feed it directly they allowed it to grow and they allowed it to take hold and here you have it you know here we are and yeah well going to your point about the uh, sort of registration and Democrat Republican comes down to turnout right. So this and is where independence, right? Well, this is where the issue of the Bernie Sander, where are the Sanders voters, and we're in Berkeley, where my daughter says, My God, mom, I can't take my Hillary sweatshirt to Berkeley High. Nobody is for Hillary at Berkeley High. So what do we do? What's going on? How do we what's going on for Ber for Trump to attract, he's trying to attract those Trumps, the Bernie supporters. Hillary is too. Does it come down to turnout for those voters? Well, I think turnout will be important, but the independents are also important. And again, I'm just gonna go back to the, the, and say that right now it looks like the independents are breaking for Hillary. There's no question about that. I mean, this is an election by fundamentals that the Republicans should win. They should win because there's an incumbency disadvantage for a party. Obama's been in for two terms. That means that people even discount the economic results he's gotten. And furthermore, the economic results he's gotten aren't that great in terms of helping the middle class. Although there have been some recent reports that suggest that last year, middle class incomes increased by about 5.2%, which was really quite impressive. But nevertheless, it came too late and it really hasn't sunk in in any way. So this is an election the Republicans should actually win, but they're looking like they're gonna lose it, and that's obviously because as bad a candidate as Hillary Clinton might be, and I don't think she's a great candidate, Donald Trump, I think, ultimately is a worse candidate. I, I, I appreciate your efforts to buck us up, Henry. <laughs> I know. Uh, I'm just trying to tell no, you what I I think the facts uh, are. Uh, I agree. I'm glad uh, it makes you happy. Uh, <laughs> um, I, so I'll speak to millennials for a second. Right. Maria, I think you were getting it, young voters, Berkeley High, right? I mean, I, so I, I'm, um, unfortunately, Technically, I am a millennial. Um, I've just made the cutoff uh, by about a year or two. Um, and so there is an endless stream of news articles about how millennials are ending, you know, whatever, and name a s workplace norm, a social or cultural norm, ending some sort of business or industry or whatever. So if you ever Google millennials are killing blank, you'll find a million results. Um, and uh, uh, one thing that the polls have found is that millennials are more likely than any other age group to say that they want to vote for a third party instead of Hillary Clinton. And um, 
and and I think that part of the part of the part of the, the what's being said there is that. Um, or what's being assumed there is that Clinton hasn't found the right policy proposals to, to uh, appeal to millennials and that Bernie said things like free college for everybody and that really, or let's eliminate student debt. And it was the policy substance that got Bernie um, uh, eyeballs for millennials. And I'm not actually sure that that's true. I mean, I'm sure that the free college helped, but I, I think that young people expect purity in a way that older people don't. When you haven't been kicked in the teeth by life a couple times, and you don't realize that you know, sort of things don't turn out your way, or you don't get everything you wanted, and you sort of drag your butt to work the next day, because that's just how life goes, and that's sort of reality for all of us. Um, it's easier to say, I want someone who plays a fair game, who doesn't take money from lobbyists, who um, uh, sort of doesn't have you know, these scandals with the Clinton Foundation, and so on. You just accept, or you expect, a certain amount of purity um, which is why I think Bernie was appealing, not the, the free college policies. And I think Clinton, for, for all of her decency on all, like, um, as her, her incredible work ethic, her incredible strength, and, and all these other things that you might want to say are Clinton's attributes, she comes off as a status quo candidate from inside the system in a really, really strong way. And I think that's what turns off young people. So I this is very non-scientific, and I can't think of uh, who, who actually made this argument. I thought it was kind of compelling. There was this interesting article about how older um, women are much more likely to want to support Hillary, um, and in part because it's important to them to see a woman get elected president. And um, of course, younger uh, women are you know, feel as though, well, why should I vote for Hillary Clinton just because she's a woman and I'm a woman? This is ridiculous. And this person, I, pro I apologize for not remembering, they made this argument that, well, maybe one, po there are a lot of possible explanations for this, this, this generational divide. But one possibility is that younger women haven't been around long enough to see how Sexism can act starts to play a bigger and bigger role as you get older. When you start having kids, when you start trying to climb the ladder, that's when you experience some of the um, some of the obstacles more and more. And maybe this cohort of individuals hasn't yet seen that. I have no idea if this is valid, but I thought it was an interesting argument. No, absolutely. I, I for any of you who have uh, children or if you are grad students in the audience, but you have children who are thinking of uh, graduate studies, there are so many topics just raised in today's, tonight's discussion that should be wow. researched. Um, I wanna thank you all. We, have, we could speak for hours. I'm dying to ask my own questions, but I'm being very respectful of everyone's time. Thank you all for a really great conversation. Chloe, I hand it to you. I have to say, what a tremendous dialogue and what a proud night for Cal. And as this great evening concludes, please join me in thanking our moderator, Maria Estrebeste. Sarah Anzia. And to someone who I've read all his works, though he doesn't know it, Jack Glazer. <laughs> Dean Henry Brady. And the one person that really represents most of the views of our students and <laughs> our young alumni on campus, Jonathan Stein. I also want to thank my in-house staff, and there are many who deserve recognition, but this team is led by the editor of California Magazine, Wendy Miller. And her team includes Jennifer Mora, Senior Development Director, our director, of Marketing and Communications, Sarah Juckness. And our Forever Events Director, Associate Director of Alumni Engagement, David Smith. Thank you all for your relentless work and making this evening possible. Now with the incredible success of California Live held in Los Angeles in May, 
celebrity politics in the digital age, and our full house tonight, we are thrilled to share that CAA will be expanding its alumni engagement resources to be able to provide more enhanced alumni services, more intellectually stimulating and cutting edge events like this one. And naturally, we look forward to seeing all of you again. Thanks to each and every one of you for joining us tonight. The Golden Bear is roaring. Go Bears. <laughs>